thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, for this seminar. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, all right, so uh, he introduced me. Uh, I don't need to repeat uh, my name. <laughs> so you all know who I am. Uh, okay, first let me start with uh, uh, thanking all my contributors. Uh, the people who helped me do all the research that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, by the way, I, I cannot talk about everything today. We did in, in the last you know many years we did so much, so I had to restrict myself to the you know 50 minutes whatever I have here. Um, so uh, uh, first, let me thank a lot of the students that work on the uh, the project that I was uh, projects that I was leading. And some uh, faculty members, because this work requires collaboration. I couldn't do it by myself. Huh? So I needed to collaborate with people from biological sciences, uh, from mechanical engineering, from biochemistry. And also I'd like to thank some of my postdocs that contributed to this work. So these are, these are very important people who helped me achieve the results I'm going to show you. So why are we talking about low temperature plasmas? Well, low temperature plasmas are ionized gases, weakly ionized gases, but at low temperature. And we are able to generate them at atmospheric pressure, so we don't need vacuum systems that are cumbersome and very expensive and not really very applicable in medicine. So uh, uh, low temperature plasmas, uh, they have uh, many components Electric field are one of them. The, uh, they can generate UV radiation between, especially the ones between 200 and 300 nanometer. Uh, charged particles, electron and ions, that's because it's an ionized gas, so it has negative charges, positive charges. And uh, most importantly, they generate, uh, there is chemistry going on in, in the plasma that generate reactive species. Some of them are, uh, because we use air, so air has oxygen and nitrogen, right? And some other, you know, few percentages of other things, but mostly uh, oxy <clears throat> oxygen and nitrogen. So we can generate oxygen-based and nitrogen-based reactive species. These are very, very important, as you'll see in uh, the biomedical application I'm gonna talk about. So you start with some sort of plasma source. Uh, LTP stands for temperature plasma, low temperature plasma source, and you want to you know, uh, apply it to usually it's a suspension that has cells, at least for in vitro work in the lab. So the cells can be uh, either bacteria or mammalian cells, and what you wish, what you're really doing, you're, you're blowing all these reactive species that generally come in the plasma, and they go and interact the target, which is the suspension containing, uh, uh, containing the cells. So it's a very complex system when you want to study it, because you go from the gaseous state to the liquid state, to the biological state, which are cells, and plasma itself is very complicated, and biological systems are very complicated. So it's a very, very complex system that you work with. There's a lot of variables you need to keep in mind when you do this work. So what are we trying to do here? We, we call it the plasma kill and plasma heal paradigm. Plasma kills the bacteria, but plasma can also heal. Like for example, your wounds, maybe even heal cancer. Uh, so uh, uh, we wanna go from the medieval setting where if you have a wound that cannot heal, you have to amputate, you know, chop your leg in this case to move to something a lot more like this, where you can use uh, uh, plasma, and the, what, what, what are the, uh, what's in the toolbox of plasma is all this reactive species that we are able to generate. So the plasma is really kind of the middleman making all these reactive species that are delivered to a biological target, so it can do you know, some uh, 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 impact on that target whatever uh, that impact is. So that is the, you know, this is kind of a general picture of what I want you to keep in mind, that that's what we're trying to achieve. Huh? 
So the, as I said, the reactive species, they come really from the reaction. The, uh, the plasma has very en uh, low temperature plasmas that we work with has very energetic electrons that can collide with the background atoms and molecules and, and can excite the molecules or the atoms can break you know, the, uh, the molecules into radical parts and things like that. So here are some, I thought to mention, you know, few reactions that you can keep in mind. For example, electron colliding with uh, nitrogen and creating atomic nitrogen or, or with oxygen and creating atomic oxygen. Atomic oxygen is very reactive. It's, it's not like oxygen, the O2, that like we breathe in the air. Once you have one atom, it becomes extremely reactive. It's try to attach itself to something, react with something. So anyway, you can generate ozone, which is O3. You can generate NO2. You can generate what, what's called the single delta oxygen, which is long-lived radicals that can do some reactions. Uh, OH, for example, in this reaction here, that's a hydroxyl radical. That's also, it's well known in biology and uh, and and also it's well known in biology. It has a lot of effect on cells and, and biological systems in general. So the plasma, these are just examples. Now, there are hundreds of uh, possibilities and reactions that, uh, that can happen. So very quickly, uh, I know a lot of us here are, uh, this is mostly probably electrical engineering student, including myself, and we probably don't know that much chemistry, but just to, uh, uh, I thought to, <clears throat> to show you what I'm, when I say ROS, which is reactive oxygen species, the, these are some examples, you know? the, the oxygen uh, superoxide O2 minus and, and, the, uh, 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 and the OH and the hydrogen peroxide. And these are the, when I talk about ROS, that's what I mean. Uh, what, what do they do? They do a lot of stuff in, for biological systems. They uh, cause peroxidation of uh, lipid bilayer. You know, cells, they have this, they have this uh, uh, membrane that's made out of a lipid bilayer. And so uh, they can oxidize and peroxid, uh, peroxidation reaction with the lipid bilayer. Uh, also, oxidation of proteins of the, uh, that are existent also in the cell wall and they can cause uh, DNA damage, uh, respiration damage with ozone, also etching. A lot of people here maybe know a little bit about uh, semiconductor uh, etching. Uh, we use oxygen plasma usually. So since we have oxygen, this could be etching of biomaterials. Um, and we uh, have to measure these things because we, not, we, we want to correlate between the biological outcomes that we see and this species. So we've got to measure, identify them, who they are, and also concentration. So uh, some of our methods, this is kind of a very complicated advanced method. It's called laser-induced fluorescence. Uh, for example, when I measure the concentration of uh, OH, the hydroxyl. So we have a laser that will, that will uh, it shoot in here and then goes where the plasma, the, the pink stuff is the plasma, and then it's going to excite the OH, and then when it relaxes, it emits light that's called fluorescence, a different wavelength, and then we detect the fluorescence, and the intensity of the fluorescence tells us how much OH you are making. So I thought I'd show you this as an example, uh, and here are some measurements. So you can measure the OH density versus the radius of the plasma. And you can see in this experiment, it's mostly concentrated around the middle. Huh? And then as you go out radially, it's kind of uh, it drops off. So it tells us about the distribution and it tells us about the concentration, it tells us what's the, where the action is taking place. Um, uh, also, we found out that uh, when you apply this plasma, if you have a target, the condition of the target plays a role. This is a case, for example, the red is you have a wet surface, the green is the skin of a mouse, and uh, the uh, blue is a dry surface. And you can see the, the huge difference uh, between the concentration 
of uh, OH depending on the surface that you are treating. So you even the target that you're treating has an influence on this distribution and concentration of the uh, reactive species, such as OH in this case. Uh, another important uh, species is hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, you can, uh, here I give you some example how it's made. For example, you make OH and 1OH and 1OH get together and make it H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide. And um, it's even made in, inside the cells, but that's a little, I don't know how much biology you all know, but that's, uh, the, the, there is a, uh, uh, an enzyme called superoxide dismutase that can react with um, uh, uh, the superoxide O2 minus and make H2O2 inside the cell. So these, uh, th these are important theoretical, so we want to measure them. So here is, uh, this work is done here in my lab to measure the concentration of, uh, of uh, hydrogen peroxide we make. Uh, it's in micro, molar, and this is how much time we expose the target to the plasma. And you can see, we can measure very accurately how much H2O2 we are making. And uh, the other reactive species, I, I was talking about example of ROS, uh, reactive oxygen species. The other one are the RNS, which is reactive nitrogen species. One of them is extremely important, this NO. NO is a, it's a very, very important molecule. I'm gonna tell you in a minute what it does. But, uh, but, but that's, that's um, uh, uh, one example. There are some others I wanted to mention. So you have an idea when I say RNS, what molecules I'm talking about. But if you, if you just look at NO, which is, uh, that's not NO, huh? that, that's nitrogen and oxygen. So, uh, so nitric oxide, uh, it plays a uh, role in proliferation of cells, in the regulation of deficiencies, induction of azotitosis, regulation of oxygen synthesis. So this is a very important biological, uh, molecule, well, a molecule, important biological. Um, and so we have to, as usual, gotta measure the density so we know what we are working with. This is an example for different power, how much power we apply in the plasma. We get, we get different levels. Uh, uh, the distribution along the axial position. So it tells us a little bit of information about this uh, species that we are working on. Uh, we make hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, when it reacts with one of these RNAs, with one of these uh, nitrogen, uh, reactive nitrogen species, it can form something also very important. It's called peri. Uh, uh, peroxynitride, and uh, which is O N O O minus, and uh, uh, O. If you make if a cells interact with O N O O minus the peroxynitride, it depends on the pathway. It can go to uh, 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 some activation in the cells that leads to uh, apoptosis. Apoptosis, by the way, is what's called the programmed cell death. So. Our cells every day, we lose, you know, millions of cells. They die of a normal, regular process called apoptosis. It's, it's just kind of program. So there's no harm in that. Uh, however, it can, it, 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 there's another pathway it can uh, lead to lipid peroxidation, for example, or protein nitration uh, or oxidation, and it can lead to necrosis. Necrosis, that's when, uh, that's another method of death of cells but, the, but the, the cells basically, you know, is lysed, which means explodes, and then the content are spilled outside. That's why when you have necrotic tissue, you have inflammation, because the immune system sees all this junk basically coming out. So apoptosis is programmed cell death. Necrosis is kind of brute force, where you uh, kind of uh, uh, kill the cell. Uh, so, uh, uh, depending on the pathway of uh, peroxynitride, it can cause either way. So anyway, so what kind of plasma do we use to, for this biomedical work we do? Well, plasma, they come in all kinds of, you know, there are very, very hot plasmas, very dense plasmas, 
uh, that, and that's not what we want. Uh, for example, this plasma here coming from a device called Tokamak, this is where they use it to make energy. Uh, this is extremely hot, but it's almost as hot as the sun, or even hotter than the sun. So that's not the plasma we want to use, right? And there's low pressure. Uh, for biomedical, we cannot just use low pressure plasma because you cannot put the patient inside the vacuum chamber. If, if, you know what's, what's going to happen, right? If you are in vacuum. And then, of course, there are plasma torches, plasma cutters. All these are useful uh, for industrial application, but you cannot apply it on you know, sensitive tissue and, or cells or human beings. So we, we had to come up with new type of plasma, low temperature plasma that we can generate at, at uh, room pressure, atmospheric pressure. So there, uh, there are different types. The, this is the plasma pencil developed here at ODU. Uh, and this is another one of our plasmas. These are other plasmas, the uh, devices developed but some, some other groups. So these are just few examples. Huh? So these are suitable for biomedical application. The, those are obviously not. And these are, and that's the ones that, those are the, you know, the tools that we're gonna use, the devices we're gonna use. Uh, very quickly, I show you all the devices, or not all, but most of the devices we developed in my lab here. Um, so we, we, we can make what's called large volume plasmas, uh, we, or we can make what's called plasma jets. So you have a jet, this is my hand here, you can see it there in the jet hit in my hand, or we can make microplasmas. Uh, we had, I had some collaboration with uh, dental hygiene and they wanted to have this really micro jet of plasma uh, that can go into uh, root canal and things like that, so we developed uh, micro, we call them micro pencils. They're very thin, less than a millimeter in diameter. It's like a, it's like a needle, and we can also shoot plasma through capillaries. That way, you know, in the future, we may be able to insert the capillary to treat something inside the body. So we can do all these things. Okay. So now I'm gonna get into actually the core, the meat of what I want to talk about today. And that's the biomedical application of these plasmas. Is this water for me? It looks half, half. Can I have some water? <laughs> I'm getting thirsty. Uh, Is that I, possible? I, I, I Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so first I thought for the non-biologist, remind you that cells come in two types. Uh, the one uh, called prokaryote and the other eukaryote. Prokaryote like bacteria, and the prokaryote uh, cell, they don't have a, you know, uh, a real nucleus, so they call them, um, uh, what, uh, I guess, no membrane-bound organelles in there. So even the DNA is just floating inside the cell in the cytoplasm. Uh, the eukaryote, which, which means true kernel, so they have their DNA, contained within a nucleus, and every, uh, every part, uh, every system in the cell is contained within its own membrane, it's all, they call them organelles. So that's a, like our cell, mammalian cell. That's a very complicated cell. Huh? So you can imagine that probably life probably started more like the simplistic uh, prokaryotic cells that evolved into a more complex system. So, uh, the, so you expect them not to react the same way to any external, uh, external environment, okay? Thank you very much. You appreciate it. I'll take uh, one second break. So I put this slide just in case you know, when I started working biomedical application of plasma, the last biology uh, course I took was in high school. So I had to re-educate re myself. So every time I present to engineers, I try to you know, insert some of these slides just in case you forgot about this uh, concept. So the first work that I started, I started with uh, you know, an activation of bacteria. So I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna go through this very quickly because I wanna talk about work on, on mammalian cells, which is more interesting to me nowadays. In the early days, I was interested in that. There's a huge problem 
right now, which is the number of new resistant antibiotics is going down while many bacteria are getting to be resistant to antibiotic. So this is just an example. So we have a really big crisis because of this adaptation of the bacteria and resistance to antibiotic. This, these are actually scientific paper from very uh, prominent journal like the Lancet Medical Journal. The crisis of new antibiotic or uh, urgent need for antibacterial agents. So, uh, so little known to me that uh, when I started working in this field that actually there is a crisis like that. I, I, I started doing this just out of curiosity. I just wanted to know what are the effect of plasma on cells, you know? Plasmas usually are used for lighting, for making energy, for plasma TV. Nobody had the idea what does it do when it interacts with a biological system. And I had that curiosity. So that I didn't know there was such a need. Just wanted to see on a just scientific level when plasma interacts with biological systems. What happened? So uh, I started with bacteria. So you can see here, uh, it takes only you know few minutes to kill. Uh, you know this is called six log reduction uh, the population of E. coli to to the left, and uh, uh, that's another bacteria. Um, uh, you, you can see it depends on the bacteria. It takes maybe sometimes longer time to be able to kill them because some of the resistance that uh, resistant that others. But that's the work I did way back when in the mid nineties where I actually you know discovered that you know we can use this low temperature plasma atmospheric pressure to kill bacteria. So that was the that was the start of the story. And uh, later on when I came to ODU here, uh, I developed this uh, plasma jet because my purpose was really to apply plasma on skin, on a, you know, patient. So the plasma, I gotta get the plasma out from a, from a, you know, containment, from a chamber, out into the environment. And that at the time that was, you know, m many people thought it was not possible. So we we actually developed the, the, this device we call the plasma pencil, and that's when we did also a few, few experiment on bacteria. Uh, this is uh, to the left uh, E. coli, and the control means means uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the dish where we did not apply plasma. And these are the experimental dishes where we applied 30 seconds, 120. And you can see all the location, wherever the plasma pencil hits, there is no growth. Bacteria is dead, uh, inactivated. And the longer, from 30 seconds to 120 seconds, you see the area gets bigger and bigger. And we also did experiments to show that if we, usually we use helium because helium keeps the plasma really cold and room temperature. But if we add a little bit of oxygen, uh, its effect becomes even more pronounced. Why? Huh? Remember the ROS, huh? oxygen, for example, uh, atomic oxygen. So you get a, a stronger effect. And we did on all Actually, kinds of bacteria. Problems. I worked with a professor in biology called Professor Wayne Hines. Maybe some of you know him. And we did, we worked on a lot of different bacteria, gram negative, gram positive, and uh, so you can see here some of the results we got. And um, I've just shown them as an example. Uh, to, uh, and, and we also, uh, I also was very curious to see visually what happens to the bacteria when we, after we hit them with plasma. And you can see in the case of E. coli to the left, that's a normal E. coli, how it looks like. And then after you treat it with plasma, you lyse it, explodes, you know. The, the content, internal content of the bacteria spins out, and you can see it's a, a big clump of a mess on the right. Those are dead E. coli. So, uh, uh, summarize this very quickly because I really want to talk to you about something uh, else. Uh, so, this, uh, you can see here that we can inactivate a lot of different bacteria. We can lice, even spores, um, and we can use the jet or or large volume plasma, doesn't matter. Um, and to date, nobody, there's, there's 
you know, today there's a large community uh, working in the field. Uh, there has not been any report that bacteria actually can uh, build, if you like, resistance to plasma, which is good news, huh? So let me talk about now the main thing I really want to talk about is the effect on mammalian cells. Mammalian cells are like our cells. So uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you about cancer cells and healthy cells. So there, there has been work you know, done on this uh, eukaryotic mammalian cells, uh, both in vitro and in vivo. And I thought I'd give you just a few bullets to show you, you know, their work to show that uh, we can, after we apply plasma, we can detach cells, we can uh, uh, have apoptosis happen, which is programmed cell death. We work on all kinds of cancers, some of it here at ODU, some from my colleagues all around the world. Uh, we, we, uh, our first work on cancer, we started with leukemia, uh, but the latest work we've been doing was mostly prostate and carcinomas and things like that. So we, uh, that's, uh, but, but, but there's a lot, huh? there's um, even brain, even people working on brain cancer, uh, glioblastoma and all that. Uh, the in vivo also, on animals, huh? on mice, and now we are getting to a stage to clinical trial with humans. But in vivo uh, for wound healing, because it turns out that plasma can can disinfect your wound to kill the bacteria, but also can enhance the proliferation of uh, like fibroblasts, which are you know cells that needed uh, to to close the wound. So uh, uh, useful for wound healing. Wound healing actually there was clinical trials already uh, for wounds that do not heal because some people have diabetes and they have this uh, venous ulcers on their legs. Usually they just chop their leg, but I'll show you some picture at the end. And um, <coughs> anyway, so these are some of the, I uh, don't want to spend too much time on this slide. So cancer, what's, what's the deal with, with, with this uh, disease, huh? cancer? Uh, well, cancer uh, cells, they, know how to camouflage themselves, your immune system doesn't recognize there is a problem, and so, and they can evade apoptosis. Uh, I hope you all can see it, it's because of the light, you can see it very well, but um, uh, they have self-sufficient uh, growth uh, uh, signals, they have insensitivity to anti-growth uh, uh, signals, uh, they invade tissue everywhere, that's called metastasis, and become metastatic, and so the cancer can start somewhere, end up somewhere else, and uh, they can, it can just replicate on and on and on. Sustained angiogenesis, that means uh, it gets blood vessels so it can feed itself. So it's, it's really a very nasty state of affair with, when a cell becomes uh, malignant like that. So uh, that, the, these are the hallmark of cancer. Uh, usually the way you know, it progresses, you know, you've got some, you know, uh, uh, mutation in, in a cell, then they call what's called hyperplasia. It's not cancer yet, but it's kind of multiplying too much. Too much. And then it gets to even uh, to this uh, dysplasia, which is uh, which, uh, growth, and also starting to get in malignant. And then, uh, and then the cancer can develop, and then, of course, it can travel and goes, it becomes very invasive and goes and goes in, uh, in other places. So, uh, so you can see it's, you know, that's why we're having a hard time, you know, finding real cures to cancer, it's very complicated. So we tried some experiment, I'm gonna show you what we did uh, using our plasma pencil, I have a picture of it there. And uh, I'm gonna uh, talk to you, uh, obviously I can cover everything. I can tell you, I can talk until midnight tonight with uh, like 300 slides or so, I could, <laughs> they won't fit in this talk. So I kind of narrow it down. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna just talk to you a little bit of summary so you have an idea. So I have the, uh, uh, we selected uh, epithelial cells and uh, they are adherent cells, which means they adhere to a surface. And then uh, the, the, um, the um, uh, scaber here, that's the, uh, that's the cancer. Uh, and the MDCK, 
that is a normal, healthy cell. And we, uh, when I compare, when we hit them with plasma, what happens to the cancer cell, what happens to the healthy cell. These are some images so we have an idea how they look like. It's not very clear. Sorry about that. Okay, and then there are many assays we use to see, you know, if the cells are alive, dead, so we can count and see efficiency of our treatment. Uh, we use uh, uh, two different tablets called Tripan Blue Exclusion and Assay. That's when if you, if you kind of show holes in, in the cell, Tripan Blue can come in, and the cells become, uh, they become, you know, dark because the dye gets in there, and you can see it with the microscope. And then the ones that are alive, they, you stay kind of transparent, see in the dark, and I have an example there with the green, I don't know how it looks like, and, and the red there, head cells, and you can see them very dark. Uh, and also we use something uh, called the uh, uh, MTS assay, and that tells us if the cells are actually uh, have activity, metabolic activity, so we know they have life, and if the metabolic activity goes away, we know they're either in senescence or to be dead. So we try, we, we use uh, both methods to check on that. Um, uh, we use two different type of treatments. One, we apply the plasma directly to the suspension where the cells are. That we call that direct treatment. So the cells are in there, and we just you know shoot the plasma and for different times, you know, two minutes, three, four, six minutes. And then um, we incubate, and then you know we count how much life, how much dead. Uh, there is another method, uh, which is we call it the indirect method. The indirect method, we treat the medium, and then we put the medium on top of the cells. Both methods work more or less the same, by the way. But uh, the but the advantage I'm going to mention it later is here you can treat the medium, put it in the fridge and use it eight hours later. So it becomes almost like a drug huh? that you can keep. This is called plasma activated media or PAM. So, uh, um, uh, so these are the two different methods. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a lot about PAM because we recently we've been doing a lot of work. It's, it's a lot easier to work that, uh, with PAM because you can store it, you can use it later and all that. So, uh, um, and I show you some of the results we, we got. I don't want to get into all the details and the numbers because it will take uh, it will take too long. So let me uh, let me show you the result. Well, so cell viability. Cell viability means we want to know how much after we hit them with plasma, how much they survive. So for the, the this is the direct case. Um, so we. Um, um, th this is how much time we expose them to plasma, Z zero to 3.5, five minutes of exposure. And then we look at them and we find out that uh, there's no, nothing, nothing happened. So what does it mean? This means plasma is not working? No, it means the plasma is not applying brute force on the cells that is blast and kill them right away. This is right away, immediately after treatment. We, you can see the, there's very little dead cells. Most the, the dark here is life. Most of them are life. So, however, if you wait 12 hours later, suddenly cells are dying. 24 hours later, you can see for six minute treatment, they're all dead. So that means these are biochemical mechanisms. There are the chemical pathways that that it requires biological times. They don't. They are not instantaneous. It requires normal biological time for the cell to finally respond because there's a lot of stuff going on. I'll talk a little bit about it later. So the the plasma. This is a proof that we are not just the plasma is not like burning or blasting or just doing physical force and killing the cell. It's actually it's triggered something. And then 12 hours later, 24 hours later, you see the result. Okay, now I told you about the, uh, the PAM, which is a plasma activated media. So this is how we do it. You know, we treat the, the medium and then we store it one hour, eight hour, 12 hour, and then we use it later on top of cells 
So we call it aged PAM or stored PAM. And I'm gonna show you some of the results with that. So uh, we, uh, the blue here shows you direct, right after uh, we, we apply the PAM, and then we wait 12 hours later. And the, we, uh, that's the blue curve. So it's, it's killing very quickly. However, you can see if we age the PAM, put it in the fridge and then put it out, you can see if we put it, you know, eight, eight hours later, the effect kind of dims a little bit. Because all, what, what's happening is all those reactive species, uh, after a while, they just react with each other and just their concentration becomes very low. So that's when you age it, huh? So you lose some of the potency of that. However, if you treat long enough, Remember, this is for different exposure times, one, two, three, four minutes. If you look at the three minutes, for example, doesn't matter. You, you use immediate time or, or you age it, the result will be more or less the same. So this tells us that there is a dose effect. It's dose dependent. If you put the right dose, you get the right effect. Eight hours later, 12 hours later, you still get a very good effect. So you cannot just you know, do very little. Like every medication, huh? Uh, all medication, yeah, dose it. If you take too little, maybe it doesn't have an effect. You take, you take too much, it'll kill you, right? If you take the right doses, you'll, you'll get better. So this is tell us there is a uh, dose dependent, you know, uh, phenomenon going on. So what we did here, we, t we compared our plasma with, with a, a starosporine, which is a drug that kills cancer cells, okay, that cause apoptosis. And we wanna see, hey, what's, uh, what's the uh, uh, effect of our plasma compared to this well-known you know, drug, starosporine, that will kill. And you can see here, uh, uh, 10 minutes, our plasma is the black. We actually do better. Uh, sorry, that's 10 hours. 10 hours later, our plasma is doing better than the starosporine. And 24 hours later, they are almost, you know, the steel plasma is a little better. But, um, but anyway, this tells us that our plasma is having, you know, this apoplastic effect on these cancer cells. This is not a joke. We are killing the cells just as well or even better than this apoptosis co syndrome. Uh, this here, the, the control, you can see the control because we didn't apply either starosporine or didn't apply plasma. It keeps growing huh? because it keeps multiplying. Proliferation because cancer cells, they proliferate. Uh, there is effect, remember I mentioned the effect on the DNA. Uh, DNA, you can cause a single strand break. That usually gets repaired. But if you do double strand break, actually, the, the DNA gets damaged. And usually what happens is when the cells realize the DNA is damaged, it commits apoptosis. So uh, 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 we, I'm gonna show you a picture here. This, was, this picture was not taken in my lab. I got it from a colleague of mine in the UK that's doing kind of similar work. And this is, a, this is the uh, uh, nucleus. Uh, they put there's something called DAPI, if it was microscopy, and usually Chinese blue, and then uh, all the paint dots, those are double strand breaks. So this is visual evidence of all the double strand breaks that are happening in the DNA, and that's why they see. I think they did this on prostate cancer, if I remember correctly. They see all this cell death. So. Um, All right, we talked about, uh, again, I can't go to, I have so many results I can show you, but, but uh, uh, I would rather uh, 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 show you now the effect on healthy cells. No, but I'm not showing you our results on leukemia or on a prostate, uh, so I've just kept it on this uh, carcinoma on, with the epithelial cells. So, um, uh, so these are uh, these are uh, healthy epithelial cells. They come from uh, kidney. This. Okay, so we uh, apply this plasma activated medium on these cells, 
and the plant we activate the median two, four, six, eight, ten minutes. And you can see that up to about three, four minutes, there's almost a hundred percent viability of this substance. But when you go after four minutes, the doses is so high, the cells are dying. Ten minutes we you kill all of them. Again, the story of those mechanisms. I have the so however this is very good news for us because two minutes for cancer cells they killed them. But two minutes for the other cells, they are still and but don't generalize on this. This is for this particular cell, okay? So up to three, four minutes you are killing the cancer cells a lot more than you're killing the healthy cells. I think I'm, I have some other plot to show you. Yeah, here, here is another form. Okay, that's the PAM, and that's the cell percentage cell viability. And you can see the big difference between the uh, SCABR and the MDCK. Huh? So there's a lot more survival. This is the cancer. This is the the uh, uh, the healthy cell. The healthy cells are there versus the uh, versus the cancer cell. This is this is the same plot, but in a scatter plot like this. Yeah, you can see the red one is the cancer, the, the, the scaber, and the blue one is MDCK. You can see a two minute here, you killed so much for, it's killed by 90% versus almost nothing for the healthy cells. And that is 12 hours later. We always look 12 hours, 24, 48, etc. hours later. So uh, 24 hours, you can see here, you killed almost everything at four minutes, but you still have you know, 90% of the healthy cells are still good. So what's going on here, if you wanna, if you wanna explain uh, a little more, there's a lot of, you know, we have a lot of hypotheses and a lot of explanation of what's going on. But in general, you know, we have this reactive oxygen species in, in our body, in our cells. And if you have at low level, they can be very beneficial. And you can induce proliferation of healthy cells, etc. However, if you have them at a high level, they can cause death of the cells. Why? Because there is a competition between oxidant and antioxidant, right? So if you have too much, it just it just overwhelm the capabilities of the cells to produce enough antioxidant to protect itself. And there is. Uh, uh, somewhere in the middle where actually it can cause uh, adaptive gene to to react to somehow keep the uh, the equilibrium however if you have that's to the right all the way to the right a high level of uh, reactive oxygen species it just results in cell death so um, Okay, we did another thing. I did this with uh, Professor Benka from Mechanical Engineering, who is actually has a lab called Mechanobiology Lab. So Mechanical Engineering, they also do uh, mechanics of cells and uh, the um, extracellular matrix and all that. They study all this, and he's an expert in that. So I had a collaboration with him where we did time-lapse imaging of this, the healthy cells, and we looked at them over time and taking like pictures every 10 minutes for like overnight, and we wanna see what, uh, uh, what happens to the cell visually. And you can see here, uh, control means nothing applied, uh, 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 and the PAM at zero hour. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see it. I cannot see it very well from where I am. But here you can see a lot of proliferation of the healthy cells. However, with the PAM, um, there is less proliferation. So it has an effect on stopping the, pro, uh, the proliferation PAM is the plasma activated medium. Here there is huge, you know, uh, proliferation there, but there's just small island of the cells. I hope you can see it. Uh, it's much better on my computer. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, this maybe I can show it to you. Huh? So, it's clear. It was clear. It was clear. I, I can see because it. from here I can see. So the control to the left, uh, the PAM to the right, and you can see the difference huh? in, in proliferation. So, so BAM will arrest proliferation. Even if it doesn't kill the cells, the healthy cells, it arrests some of the proliferation. And there is, a, there is a, a protein called KI67, which is a proliferation marker. 
So we wanted to look at, uh, look at it, and you can see the control, wherever there is this bright spot, that's where KI67 is expressed, and you can see it versus on the PAM, you don't see many bright spots. That's because the cells are not proliferating as much. Uh, with the uh, time-lapse microscopy, I'll show you a little movie here. This, this is the control. So what we do, we tag one cell, and, and we look at it, what happens to it. And the reason we do that is because we want to study cell migration, which has direct relation to metastasis. So uh, you can see to the left, uh, the, uh, the, that cell traveling all over the place in there. Uh, and this is, we watch this, you know, this is a movie like for uh, overnight, taking pictures every few minutes. Uh, and you can see here, for, if you compare to the, uh, to the uh, cell uh, uh, that treated by PAM, to the cells treated by PAM, and we tag one cell and we follow it, and we see how much it travels, and, you, you guys, and then you calculate the area that is covered by the cell to the left, to the right, and it, I don't even have to you know, give you the number, but you can see that to the left, covered a lot more area than the one to the right. So, so PAM causes less migration of cells. It can, it can curtail this cell migration, at least to a certain degree. Huh? Uh, here we uh, plotted the average cell speed uh, to the left and to the right. And by the way, so you all know, these are all uh, statistically significant results because we do our experiment multiple times, at, you know, many samples, and then we repeat it many times. Okay, so this is our averages of many experiments. Um, and you can see that the uh, the, um, the the cell treated by PAM migrate a lot less. So their speed is much less than the control. Okay, how about in vivo? Uh, this is all in vitro in the cell. How about in vivo? Does, does, uh, does low temperature plasma really work? Or is it just, you know, pipe dream of some scientist in a lab doing something in the tube? Does it really work in real life? Okay. So I'm going to show you. This is a colleague of mine. I had collaboration with this guy in southern Germany in Munich. And he is a uh, dermatologist. And this was, he did the first clinical trial. His, his name is Dr. Georg Isbari. First clinical trial on actual patient in a, in a hospital in Munich. And these are patients that have wounds that don't heal, like venous ulcers, and they try all the methods that just don't heal. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of the, uh, of the result that he got. Uh, so he treats them uh, with several sessions with plasma. So uh, one session is two minutes of plasma, and then, uh, and, and then he has a method to see how much uh, healing happened to the wound. And after 32 sessions he, for this particular patient and this particular wound, he found a complete remission. Uh, I have a picture, I think, in, in color that shows you even better. So the, the top versus the bottom, you can see a huge difference. Uh, uh, between, uh, this is a 61-year-old patient with a venous ulcer. And that's the plasma device they use, and, uh, which uh, looks like this, I think, in the picture here. So they put it, uh, they have a certain uh, um, distance from the wound, uh, determined by this thing here, the white legs like that. And then they, they, they turn the plasma for two minutes, and, and they have a regimen hmm, to treat these patients. And he did the clinical trial, on, of course, on many, many, many patients. Huh? And on average, there's a lot of improvement. Some patients actually heal with uh, this. And, and they have, of course, the control. Other patients who are treated by other means, other methods, other therapies, it just didn't work. So, uh, so this uh, shows you, and, of, and uh, this is just an example. There's a lot of examples out there that actually it does work. Uh, for the cancer, uh, animal studies, uh, uh, my colleague at the George Washington University uh, did experiment uh, uh, on the mice, 
and um, uh, applying uh, uh, a plasma jet on the mice. And you can show the picture here, uh, the tumor before and after, you know, um, and the control versus the treated one. And you can see the plot here about the volume of the tumor uh, up to, you know, uh, up to 22 uh, days post, um, uh, post treatment that the tumor didn't grow versus the control that grow. Of course, sooner or later, cancer is always tricky to find a way to how, to how to grow again. But this shows you a little bit for the animal study case. And the next slide I'm going to show you is kind of a little scary slide, so I apologize ahead of time because it's actually done on humans. And this is for neck cancer. And this is a patient uh, where first they, they had surgery, removed the tumor, and then they treat with the plasma. And, uh, and the, um, um, this is from April to June to August, where you can see amazing you know, re uh, uh, improvement in, the, uh, in that, um, in that ca cancerous uh, region. This was done also in Germany. Uh, uh, they have enough money and manpower to do clinical trials. So I had to collaborate with this guy. Um, so, uh, what are the main achievements in our field, plasma medicine? I'll give you a, a, a quick timeline. Uh, this is timeline in my lab. I started way back when uh, using this um, um, uh, uh, um, bacteria and the inactivation of bacteria. And as time passed by, you know, we kept adding, you know, to our experiments uh, as we invented more device. We did dental application, cancer application. Uh, even uh, 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 work with uh, um, with Leslie Green here in biochemistry on Parkinson and all that. So we we had a lot of uh, different work. Uh, so um, uh, this is the timeline of my research group. And uh, however, I want to give you a timeline of the field in general because now the field is is huge. We have there are centers all over the world, labs all over the world working working. Uh, uh, on, the, on plasma medicine. So the early work that we started here in the US and then uh, uh, there was work done in Russia on, uh, on wound healing. Uh, the first FDA approval in the US of a plasma jet dermatology happened in 2008 and in Germany in 2013, all the way to the right. And the first clinical trial that my colleague, uh, Dr. Isbari, I showed you, he did in 2010 in uh, Munich. And so, so I divided it into, you know, there's the first decade where we really had to do the original work, the foundation of the field, and then it just took off since 2005. We have, we have many conferences just on this field, of course, because it's medical, so it's a lot of, a lot of work. We have so many journals now that are just on this field, and, um, uh, and there, there are, you know, uh, youth centers in Japan, in North, uh, in South Korea, sorry, South Korea, in um, China, in uh, Germany, in France, in uh, Italy. So work going on everywhere. Uh, people kind of feel most like there's, there's most like a, a race now. Who's gonna, you know, uh, get uh, some uh, approval and actually apply in the hospital first? So it's a whole very vibrant field. Uh, so uh, these are the conclusion of what I talked about today. Again, I apologize, uh, I have a lot of material, but uh, you know, I, I have to stop at some time. Uh, so you can read the conclusion, but however, instead of reading all this, I wanna show you this, uh, that what the paradigm shift that we really wanna achieve is we wanna go from physical and chemical drugs to energy-based treatment and therapies, except that there is already energy, you know, like uh, radiation therapy for cancer. However, we want to get it to non-thermal and low energy so we don't eliminate the side effects. So basically what we want to do, we want to go from this picture where the doctor is coming and with a knife and shoot you and open you up and you are very scared. We want to change that to this picture. But you are happy because it's just plasma, remote control to turn it on and treat you, and you're just happy, right? So hopefully that 
uh, uh, someday will, will, will happen. And I'd like to thank you now and take your questions. Cells and cancer cells coexist. How does the plasma know which to attack, which not to attack? Yeah, repeat. I'm sorry. When the healthy cells and cancer cells coexist, yeah. how does the plasma know which cells to attack and which cells? No, the plasma doesn't. Does the plasma doesn't attack here and not here? It attacks everywhere. However, the cancer cells are a lot more susceptible to the plasma attack versus the healthy cells because the cancer cells are deregulated. They produce because they are very. They replicate a lot and use a lot of resources. They are under high oxidative stress. So when you put more oxidative stress on the plasma, it just overwhelms and die. The normal cells, they are not under that much, as, as much as, uh, because they don't replicate as much. They are a lot calmer, right? So they don't produce as many, uh, 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 they don't, they're not at the same oxidative stress as the, as the uh, uh, cancer cells. And they are when their system is regulated, so they can kind of cope with it. While the cancer cells they can't cope with it, but it doesn't choose the cell. That doesn't know. Any more question? Uh, to this, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for giving an exciting talk. Mm -hmm. I have uh, quite a few questions. Uh, this is really good. And, you are entitled uh, only to one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yes. yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, for the uh, plasma uh, pencil, like. Uh, yeah. you, Right now, you use a pencil because I have been thinking of those like uh, cleaning dishes and uh, like for, for, for like at home like, sterilizing, yeah. and decontaminating. Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, is, uh, do you, uh, is there any like a product from yes, plasma? Yes, there is. There is. Oh, there is. There is actually. I have a colleague of mine has a company <laughs> who, who makes things for for homes using oh, plasma. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also yeah. for for those like cells, I have seen you have shown like. Uh, uh, the percentage of cells yeah. uh, still survive mm -hmm. after like uh, 24 hours yes. or something. So like say, uh, if we apply the plasma for one minute and then uh, we stop, so the cells uh, we uh, will not be affected after this one minute, right? So it will be affected only if you apply the plasma. It, uh, it, it, when you do direct treatment, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. But if you do the plasma activated medium, you can apply at any time you like. Oh, okay. Because you cover them with this. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, uh, the, the activated media is almost like a drug. Mm -hmm. And you can use it later and you can apply for an hour if you want. Mm -hmm. So it depends if you're direct or indirect. Oh, oh yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yeah, uh, I, I think we are also running a little bit uh, late. Uh, yeah, uh, late. Sorry. So uh, uh, th thank you. Uh, let's uh, thank uh, Dr. Lorenzo again for giving a.